Welcome back. Mr. Clark's here. Time to take a look at the mass culture movement in the 1950s. Some of the things we'll be looking at here in 15.6 will be the rise of the suburbs, the growth of the interstate highway system. We'll look at the causes and effects of prosperity on consumers in the 1950s. We'll look at the post-war changes in family life, changes in education, new forms of mass culture. So for the first question, we look at the push and pull factors that led people to move into the suburbs in the 1950s. Some of the push factors, the nation suffered from a severe shortage in urban housing or housing in big cities. Housing construction declined during the Great Depression and World War II. There's issues with crime and traffic, all of which allowed for people to have motivating factors that kind of pushed them into the suburbs. Pull factors that kind of brought them in there. Federal housing assistance loans or from the federal government loans that allow people to get a mortgage with a small down payment. Suburbs like Levittown introduced affordable and comfortable homes. States and the federal government funded highway construction. Cars were more widely available, which made it easier, obviously, to move in the suburbs and then work a little further away. Two, how did William Levitt revolutionize the housing industry to help meet the high demand for housing during the growth of the suburbs in the 1950s? So again, just like we had seen with Henry Ford and his uh, mass-produced automobile that became affordable for all Americans, and Henry Kaiser, who revolutionized, revolutionized shipping during World War II, Levitt came up with a plan to mass-produce hundreds of simple and similar-looking homes off the very same blueprint, first on a potato field 10 miles east of New York City. Later on, he built Levitt towns in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So mass-produced homes were more affordable for families to buy. So from 1947 to 1951, families rushed in to buy homes in Levittown, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. You can see like a postcard promoting it with different styles. There's a couple different models to choose from. You can see that on the left. On the right side, you can see the homes that were built relatively close together, one after the other. And this was Levittown in the 1940s and 50s. Okay, we had alluded a little bit to uh, in previous discussions about the Interstate Highway Act being one of the most important accomplishments of Eisenhower's presidency. So looking at number three, how did the Interstate Highway Act impact America? The Interstate Highway Act was the largest public works project in the history of the United States of America. The act appropriated $25 billion over a 10-year period of time to build 40,000 miles of interstate highways. In 1990, they renamed the Federal Interstate Highway System the Dwight David Eisenhower System of Interstate and Defense Highways. So we do honor Eisenhower even many, many years after his death. So we look there, a little visual there, the Interstate Highways built, Federal Housing Highway Act passed in 56, 40,000 miles of interstate highways, interstate roads, including I-20, I-30, I-35, I-45, and many other highways, I-95 around the uh, country. Four, how did the rise of the automobile contribute to the growth of the suburbs and impact families? Cars became more affordable as highways were built between cities and the suburbs, and more and more Americans were kind of connected together. Both of these developments made it easier to live in the suburbs and commute into the city. Families began to take more vacations and day trips to the beach. They began going to amusement parks like Six Flags Great Adventure or Disneyland or Disney World. Question five just kind of gives you an illustration of the number of registered automobiles and how that changed in a very short period of time from 1945 to 1960. More than doubled from 26 million in 1945 to over 60 million in 1960, which indicates that more and more families and individuals are having access to an automobile. Six, summarize the effects of the median income for families that was on the rise during the 1950s. A median family income is kind of like uh, basically the average you know, that people have across the, the country. Families have more money to spend. They use uh, this additional income to buy cars, suburban homes. They're able to buy household appliances, refrigerators, washing machines. Housework became less time consuming. They began to buy their first television set. Parents also spent more money on their children. Seven, how did women's ideal role begin to evolve or change during the 1950s? During the 1950s, 
Women, well, uh, women were still expected to be homemakers and stay at home with the children. However, many women had worked in factories at the turn of the century and women had worked in many industries during the war. So even though stereotypically a woman's role was supposed to stay the same, many, many more women wanted more out of life. And we're gradually moving towards the women's rights movement and they're going to begin moving forward in history as we kind of move forward in our discussions during the 50s and 60s. Eight, the traditional family was a father, a mother, and children. You would probably see a lot of stereotypical billboards, you know, mom, dad, two children, the house, the picket fence, the dog, dad going off to work, mom staying home, cooking, cleaning, taking care of the children. That's how they basically kind of portrayed the average family as kind of the backbone or foundation of American society. Nine, who was Billy Graham and how did he influence society? He was an evangelist minister. He led the evangelical church. It's a form of Christianity. He got a large following. He was part of a religious revival during the 1950s. He continued to remain very influential into contemporary times. Many presidents were very close with the with Billy Graham and his son, uh, who has taken over the ministry today. Ten described the events that led to an increase in educational opportunities during the 1950s. The baby boom created a shift in priorities for Americans, and because of the number of children that needed to be educated, funding began to increase. Some states, such as California and Texas, committed to public school funding at all levels, so we're seeing more and more being invested in education in our country, which obviously is a, is a positive thing. Eleven, why did the Soviet launch of Sputnik lead to increased funding for education? Well, if you remember back to our Cold War discussion of Sputnik, Americans felt threatened by the Soviet advances in science and technology. It felt like the United States was falling behind in both in the space race and the Cold War. The United States did not want the Soviets to be ahead of the, uh, of the United States. The government chose to begin to fund more and more scientific and tech technological education in order to compete with the Soviet Union. Uh, an important thing to remember is the NDEA, the National Defense Education Act, which was passed to fund improvements in science and mathematics education. Culture really took hold during this period of time too. A lot of TV shows were really popular during this period of time. TV shows in the 1950s included I Love Lucy, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, uh, Lucille Ball, who was the star of The Lucy Show, and you can see her picture here. She lived in the area. I think she might have lived within a couple miles here of Metuchen High School, from what I've read and understand. One of the more famous authors in the 1950s is David Halberstam. Uh, he uh, put forth the idea that 1950s TV shows showed that no family problem was so great that it could not be cleared up within the allotted 22 minutes of the TV program. He was basically critical of TV shows kind of glossing over the many issues and challenges in the 1950s. The show portrayed idealized families facing easily solved problems, which was really out of touch with the, the, you know, the true nature of the 1950s. 14, how did television contribute to the creation of a national mass culture during the 1950s? Well, it began to, began to impact opinion and style. And to wrap it up with the lesson reflection, how did the decade of the 1950s bring Americans and society closer together? Well, obviously, number one is automobiles, far more mobility, and the interstate highway system allowed for easier travels. TV brought news, culture, and events to the homes and also promoted a lot of the shared cultural experiences. So if you're on TV and you're seeing commercials about refrigerators and vacuums and automobiles and a nice house and going on vacation and things like that, everybody kind of had a general goal to and they came out, I guess they came up with a slogan for that, keeping up with the Joneses, which is just a generic last name, very popular last name. Keeping up with the Joneses means that if your neighbor got a new lawnmower, or you wanted one or a new car, everybody wanted to stay pretty similar in regard to what they had so they could keep up with other middle class families during the 1950s. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion today on the 1950s culture. And until next time, Mr. Clark is out.